It's fairly common to first release the better equipped device as a sort of power display, so the Zyxel WB660S that you see right here is the most powerful Wi-Fi 7 access point from Zyxel, and yes, it has been released a few months before the ANWA 130BE. The latter did have to wait a few months until it received the support for multilink operation, while the WB660S had it from the beginning. Which is nice, but the client hardware also needed to catch up, and it wasn't until the fall of last year that we finally got a more stable performance with both Windows and Linux. That being said, the Zyxel WB660S is a beast of a device, not necessarily in terms of size, but weight and robustness. I was sure that it could be mounted outdoors, but there is no IP rating, so mount it out on your own risk. The access point comes with two ports, one gigabit, the other 10 gigabit, which is a huge step up from the 2.5 gigabit port of the NWA 130BE. The antenna gain is also better on the WBE 660S and the spatial streams are 4x4 on all three radio bands. Other than that, we do get a smart antenna once again and in terms of software management, there is not only the option to use the Nebula Cloud, but a controller and the option to use the access point in standalone mode as well. That being said, let's see the WBE 660S in action. The access point is definitely larger than the NWA 130BE, but not by that much and this new design that we see with the access points is actually very nice. It helps differentiating the Zyxel access points from the rest. The upper side is made of plastic, while the rear is metallic for a better heat management. The single LED sits at the top in a similar fashion to the NWA 130BE, which at this point can be considered a miniature WBE 660S. Flip it upside down and we get to see the intricately designed metallic bottom, and since we're dealing with a ceiling mount access point, it does come with a bracket. As for the ports, we do get quite a few surprises here. On one hand, there are two Ethernet ports, one is gigabit, the other can go up to 10 gigabits, which is excellent news considering that this is a Wi-Fi 7 access point. On the other hand, we get a USB-C port for charging if PoE++ is not available, which is a novelty feature on networking hardware. There is also a console port and a reset button. When Ubiquiti went the weird route of adding a fan to cool down the case of their Wi-Fi 7 access points, Zyxel kept the tried method of moving the heat away from the components using heat spreaders and a half of the metallic case. Did it work? It did, and as you can see, it worked better than expected. Now that we have reached the teardown section, know that I did open the access point a couple of months back and I did a dedicated video where I go far more in depth on the process of opening the device. Then again, Zyxel makes things simple as always, requiring the removal of four screws, and yes, there is no warranty seal. Why would there be one? And we quickly get a good view of the PCB. The main components are beneath the aluminum covers, but before that we need to see this smart antenna that Zyxel has proudly announced, and it has used with the WB660S, which, just like on the NWA 130BE, it does include an RF filter. I have also included a comparison table with other Wi-Fi 7 access points that I have tested so far. Before we get into the more complicated tests, let's first take a look at the more basic single client tests. I relied on multiple types of client devices ranging from the higher end Wi-Fi 7 to the still more common Wi-Fi 5 devices. And I do have several Wi-Fi 7 adapters available, but I prefer the MSI Herald BE, while the Wi-Fi 6 client is an Intel X200 and the Wi-Fi 5 one is an Intel 8265. And the results are impressive, the WB 660S managing to outclass all the other Wi-Fi 7 access points that I tested so far, going above 2.5 gigabits per second when near the client, 
and still maintaining above 1.3 gigabits per second rates at 30 feet. At 70 feet or about 21 meters we see that it drops below 100 megabits per second and after checking the signal attenuation graphic we understand why the Wi-Fi 6 client did much better in terms of range. This is all upstream so let's have a look at the downstream graphics. And you can see right away that it's only slightly worse than upstream. Things can get even better as you will soon see with the multilink operation enabled. But before that, let's have a look at how the WB660S fares against other access points when using the 80 MHz channel and 5 GHz radio. It was only second to the TP-Link AAP660HD, and it did take the first spot when using the 160 MHz channel bandwidth. Switching to the 6 GHz radio band and the 320 MHz channel bandwidth, the Zyxel WB660S once again takes the first spot. I have also also added a longer term graphic to see the fluctuations that you can expect in respect to another Zyxel access point. And there are some interesting patterns, clearly in relation to the hardware I was using. Moving on to the 2.4 GHz radio band performance, I did remove the Pixel 2 XL since it performed badly and I didn't really found a replacement for it yet. Anyway, we still get an idea about what to expect when using the Wi-Fi 6 and Wi-Fi 5 client devices. It's a fair performance, clearly adjusted to be suitable mostly for IoT devices and some old tablets. And I also included a mandatory signal attenuation graphic to make it easy for you to reproduce these results in your own home. Here we can see a comparison table with other access points. Not really at the top here, but like I said it's a fair performance, nothing spectacular. Ok, so now let's move over to the multi-client tests things get a bit more complicated, but bear with me because the concept is actually fairly simple. I have one server computer connected to the switch which powers up the access point, and then 5 client devices connected via Wi-Fi. I then use a tool called NetHydra developed by Mr. Jim Salter and which is available on GitHub to simulate different types of traffic. Then we can see the latency which we want to be as close to zero as possible. The first test simulates 1080p streaming on 5 client devices. And we can see the Wi-Fi 7 and one Wi-Fi 6 client doing decently well, while the second Wi-Fi 6 laptop rises near 100 milliseconds quickly. The Wi-Fi 5 clients immediately cross 100 milliseconds, which is not good. So far it's a somewhat similar performance to the Zyxel and WA-130BE. Running 4K streaming on the 5 clients, we see that the Wi-Fi 5 clients prefer to stay above 100 milliseconds, while the other three did a bit better, but still not a phenomenal performance. If you need to run a similar type of traffic, make sure to add at least one client using a wired connection. Now let's include Intel's browsing into the mix where a page is opened every few seconds which will run alongside the 1080p streaming. And as we can see from the graphic, the Wi-Fi 7 client again does really well. The two Wi-Fi 6 clients remain decent, but the two Wi-Fi 5 clients tend to show higher latency. When compared to the NWA 130BE, the WBE 600 60s once again does a bit better. The intense browsing graphic pushes the WB660S as a clear winner over the other Wi-Fi 7 access points that I tested so far. But we do need to run the same test with the 4K streaming instead of 1080p. And well, the streaming graphic shows one Wi-Fi 6 client as the winner, while the rest quickly rose above 100 milliseconds, which we don't want when streaming movies. It's interesting to see that the intense browsing graphic shows that, with the exception of two client devices which rose above one second for about 10% of the time, the rest actually did really well. Then again, anything below 1.5 seconds is acceptable. Moving on, I included the downloaded traffic which involves the download of a 10 megabyte file continuously and a cap involved, so the client device can request as much as it wants from the available bandwidth. And I started with two clients which in total got up to 786.6 megabits per second. Not bad considering that we do use the 80 MHz channel bandwidth and the 5 GHz radio. And the latency is actually better than expected. I know that 200 milliseconds and above is bad, but if you check out the NWA 130BE, the U7 Pro, as well as 
as the Pro Max, these are phenomenal values. The 4K streaming struggled a bit, but again much better than with other Wi-Fi 7 access points. Switching to a single downloading client, things got even better. Again, above 100 milliseconds is not good for anything other than internet browsing, but the values are still miles better than with other Wi-Fi 7 access points. Let's make things lighter for the Zyxel WB660S by using only three client devices, one for downloading, one for 4K streaming and the last for intense browsing. The downloading client's latency remained pretty much the same as before, so you need to make some other changes. I decided to download a 1MB file continuously this time, keep the intense browsing at the third client would try to run voice over IP traffic. And the downloading client did decently well this time. The intense browsing was good as always, while the voice over IP latency moved between 70 and 30 milliseconds, which I suppose is fine. Lastly, I had to run the 10 megabyte downloaded traffic on all 5 client devices, just for fun, and the results are interesting. One client, the faraway Wi-Fi 5 device, went out of the charts, but the other clients were actually handled better than expected. It's been a while since I tested the multilink operation performance of the NWA130BE and the U7 Pro, and thankfully things got much better due to the driver and firmware updates. So I decided to run some quick tests using pretty much all available configurations and the results are impressive. I have added the throughput registered using only the 6GHz radio and on both the 320MHz and the 160MHz channel bandwidth. And then I aggregated the 6GHz radio with the 5GHz one. I got the best values using the 320MHz channel width, where I saw nearly 3.3 gigabits per second upstream. But even the 160MHz channel width did better than expected. Downstream we're not dealing with some huge throughput difference, the performance staying very close to what we saw upstream. After aggregating the 6GHz radio band with the 2.4GHz one, which was set to use the 40MHz channel bandwidth, we see that it got close to 2 gigabits per second both upstream and downstream. Then I aggregated all three available radio bands and got a very good throughput, 2.73 gigabits per second, while upstream we see that it dipped below 3 gigabits per second. Lastly, I aggregated the 2.4 gigahertz and the 5 gigahertz radio bands, and this time we do need to focus on the 70 foot performance, which is much better than with all other multilink operation configurations. That's only upstream because downstream it's closer to the average performance. I also ran flant, and these are the latency values that I got. Just like the NWA in Run 30BE, there is a very comprehensive standalone platform as well. And it's also pretty much identical as we can see the four main sections on the left side. The dashboard shows detailed status info consisting of various widgets, and yes, you can choose which will stay and which will go. Then there's the monitor where we get more in depth with the status info. We can see some radio information if there is any station or WDS uplink on downlink info available, check whether the rogue AP detection found something and just have a good look at the log info. Then there's the configuration section which goes deep into network adjustments including VLAN and storm control. While under wireless there's the AP management where we can change how each radio behaves and it does include setting up SSIDs as well. You also get load balancing and DCS and a more old school approach of object configuration. Under maintenance we can change the system configuration files, update the firmware, use the diagnostic info collector and the remote capture. Sure, there is more to it but let's also have a look at the Nebula controller. Just like with the NWA and 130 be I am going to use the basic license and the experience is pretty much the same with the Zyxel WBE660S. There's a dashboard where you get to see various status info about the access point and other devices on the same site. Then we get to see the access point under devices which includes some other personalized info such as the map as well as some live tools. But the most important ones are what we find under configure because we get to set up the SSID and the radios. The SSID settings are differentiated in normal settings and some advanced ones. 
This includes the option to add and set up SSIDs and yes, here is where you get to enable the multilink operation as well. It's interesting to see that under the radio settings you can choose the channel and the channel bandwidth, but the 5GHz radio is limited to 80MHz. To go to 160MHz it is required that you scroll to the bottom of the page, identify the access point, choose the radio and then you get to change the radio settings for it individually, overwriting the global ones. Then again, before anything else, you do need to visit the license and inventory section where we can add new devices at the site where they operate and assign a license. The Zaxel WB660S costs quite a bit more than the NWA830BE, but considering the similarities in terms of features and used technologies, is it actually worth the extra cost? The WB660S is definitely a better performing device and it's the best Wi-Fi 7 access point that I tested so far, so it's worth paying extra. Is it worth double or more the price of the NWA830BE? That I'm not so sure about. You definitely don't get double the throughput or that much less latency. That's about all for now, thank you for watching and see you next time. And hopefully I will be able to create videos more often.